The setting of this unique gathering was a spacious and stately chamber in the heart of London. For the first time, an Empire statesman was to speak to a combined assembly of the Lords and Commons. The arrival of General Smuts in company with the Prime Minister and Mr Lloyd George was the signal for a great outburst of applause. Then, after a short address, the Father of the House of Commons said, I called upon Field Marshal Smuts to address you. I appreciate this honor, which is more than I have deserved, but I accept it as expressing your goodwill to myself personally and to the small country and people whom I have the honor to represent. <laughs> One occasionally hears idle words about the decay of this country, about the approaching breakup of the great group uh, which we form. What folly and ignorance. What misreading of the real signs of the times. In some quarters, what wishful thinking. <laughs> Let the enemy say, Gott strafe England. God bless England has been the response from the victims of this most fiendish onslaught in history. <laughs> this is its glory to have stood in the breach and to have kept the way open to man's vast future. And when after a long absence I see today this flame of the spirit above the flame of the blitz, I feel that I have come to a greater, a prouder, a more glorious home of the free than I ever learned to know in its palmiest days. Other allied nations, each in its own degree, share in this spirit. Think of China and its five... <laughs> Think of China and its five years of suffering at the hands of the Japanese warlords, busy with their so-called co-prosperity sphere in Asia. Think of Russia. And its unbroken spirit amid the hardest blows and the most cruel sacrifices of war. Look at the wonderful resurgence of the brave little peoples of Western Europe whom no adversity, defeat, dangers or chains can hold down. The appalling bloodletting, which is necessary for Hitler's ultimate defeat, is being administered by the Russians, and they alone can do it. We have now reached the fourth year of this war, and the defense phase has now ended. The stage is set for the last, the offensive phase. Let me set your minds at rest. I'm not going to discuss the future offensive strategy of the war. The amateur strategists can do that with greater freedom and less responsibility. <laughs> I only wish to emphasize that one phase is ended and another phase has begun. Yeah, yeah. Once the time has come to take the offensive and to strike while the iron is hot, it would be folly to delay, to over-prepare, and perhaps miss the opportunity. <laughs> Nor are we likely to do so. Of that, I am satisfied. 
I now pass on to another point and wish to emphasize the deeper significance of the struggle on which we are engaged. Persecution, domination, suppression, enslavement of the free human spirit, I extermination. These are the dominant features of the new creed as practiced in the occupied countries. This at bottom is a war of the spirit, a war of man's soul. Hitler has tried to kill the spirit and to substitute for it some air such thing. He has trampled on the cross and substituted for it the crooked cross, fit symbol for the new devil worship mm. which he has tried to impose on his country and the world. <laughs> the sufferings he has inflicted on Jews and Christians alike, the tide of horrors launched under his Gestapo regime over the fair West constitute the darkest page of modern history. This, in the last analysis, is what this war is about. At bottom, therefore, this war is a new crusade, a new fight to the death for man's rights and liberties. <laughs> and for the personal ideals of man's ethical and spiritual life. I come to this question what is the sort of world which we envisage as our objective after this war? What sort of social and international order are we aiming at? A great deal, a great deal of thought is no doubt already being given to these matters. And one may hope that we shall approach the peace much better informed and equipped than we were last time. Certain points of great importance have already emerged. Thus we have accepted the name of the United Nations. This is a new conception. Much in advance of the old concept of a League of Nations. <laughs> Again, we have agreed on certain large principles of social policy involving social security for the citizen in matters which have lain at the roots of much social unrest and suffering in the past. With honesty and sincerity on our part, it is possible to make basic reforms both for national and international life, which will give mankind a new chance of survival and of progress. And may heaven's blessing rest on our work in war and in peace. When I met General Smuts in Cairo, I labored to persuade him to come and visit us here in England. I labored hard because I saw I was struggling for a great prize. I will not detract from anything that he has said by entering upon the topics which he has covered. And I ask you, all of you, to signify your feelings by rising and giving him the acclamation which his character, his life's work, equally deserves. Someone set the key a little high, but what it lacks in melody, it makes up for in sincerity, as the illustrious company pays vocal tribute to a jolly good fellow. <laughs>